So we're welcoming now the many people who are streaming live to this important event. So I'm Michael Spence, I'm the Provost of UCL, and it's very rarely that you read a book with a kind of exam question and get to give the answer. But on page 17 of the book that's being launched this evening, Lord Wolf says, and my biggest concern is to know what the Provost thinks about me. <laughs> well, I can tell you the answer to that particular thing. And that is that the Provost, like I'm sure everybody here, but everybody in the UCL Law School, is incredibly proud to have an alumnus like Lord Wolf, who out of every page of this book speaks the UCL spirit, not just somebody with a brain the size of the universe that could hold the whole of the legal system and think about how it might work better, but also somebody with a heart to care for access, a heart to care about people experiencing unreasonable delay, a heart to think about the sorts of issues that might be important from a litigant's point of view but also that distinctive UCL capacity to imagine what the future might be to take risks. And, you know, there are volumes written about what's worked and, not, or, and, and what has not worked about the extraordinary reforms that Lord Wolfe brought during his career. But the impact of them, not only in this country, but around the common law world, has been absolutely undoubted. And so much of what you've achieved, Lord Wolf, has really shaped the direction of civil procedure, not only until this point, but will for so very long to come. So we are proud of you as someone with a UCL brain, a UCL heart, and a UCL capacity <laughs> to imagine things and how they might be different. So it is a very great privilege to, on behalf of UCL, to welcome you, but also all um, your many guests this evening and those joining us online to this very important occasion, the launch of an uncommon lawyer. And I would now like to ask, uh, ask to introduce on behalf, of, to welcome people on behalf of the faculty, our new Dean of Laws, Eloise Scottford. Thank you. Thank you, Provost, and yes, welcome. Um, Lord Wolfe, welcome back to UCL Laws. Um, it is a real honour for me as the newly appointed Dean of this faculty to join in and host this moment of celebration and recognition of your career, your life, your writing. Frankly, I don't know how you fit it all in, but you have. Reading this book, it's a book of a career, ostensibly, but when you read it, it is the book of so many careers and that one man has had that many careers is quite extraordinary. Um, you, along with Sir Geoffrey Jow, our, host, our chair this evening, are some of the very, very strong foundations on which our excellent, inclusive faculty has been built. I recognise that, we all recognise that in the faculty. Although I imagine the faculty might look a bit different from when you were here as an undergraduate. Um, I've been reading this book and really enjoying it, and there are some real gems um, from a close-up view of the birth of modern judicial review um, to the early moments where life at the bar was actually a real challenge. I think many students would enjoy reading that there were times you turned up in court and didn't quite know what was going to happen. <laughs> and maybe sometimes it didn't quite go your way. Um, and yet, and yet, there's an incredible modesty as you read these pages. Apparently things kept going wrong. And then I was suddenly appointed to some great, extraordinary office. I don't think that was a coincidence. Um, and finally, I think to the recurring theme of access to justice, which the Provost mentioned. It's such a strong theme through the book. It's such a strong theme and theme of our faculty. Um, and that connection is a really special one. So thank you um, for sharing your story um, with its rich uh, theme of UCL life in it. And the law uh, generally, and thank you for being with us this evening. We are utterly delighted to have you. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, uh, Dean. I'm so pleased to meet you. We haven't met. How long have you been in your position? 21 days. 21 days. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> some of it will be marvelous, I can tell you. Others, some, will, some of them will drive you mad. <laughs> But Bentham House is, is the most appropriate place to launch this book. Because as Harry writes on page 15 
of the book, UCL proved to be my making. And although he spent much of his time as a student, uh, and he doesn't con conceal this in any way, riding his beloved horse Cherry in the London parks and in the cavalry barracks, he was also active in starting a debating society, playing rugby, perhaps he even did some work. It's not mentioned, but perhaps he did. <laughs> on one occasion, when the annual rag on Guy Fawkes Day was cancelled, young Harry protested in the streets so vigorously that he even sampled a prison cell for the night. The hero of the book, the hero of the book must be, I'm sorry about this, Harry, but the hero of the book is surely the magistrate who imposed a conditional sentence on you, <laughs> which meant that you were not barred from pursuing a, 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 your amazing legal career. And it was amazing. Uh, as uh, Louise said, how you fit it in is just impossible to know. From army legal services to barrister to recorder to junior counsel to inland revenue, I'm skipping a few <laughs> along the line, to treasury devil, to judge, judge of the high court, of the court of appeal, to law lord, to master of the rolls, to chief justice of England and Wales. And you also chaired countless inquiries such as the access to justice, which the provost mentioned, and the strange way prison riots when you and Marguerite once again spent a night in a prison cell, uh, this time in pursuit of participant observation. Um, and you've in, uh, assisted with so many charities, NGOs, as well as co-founding uh, the Wolf Institute dedicated to interfaith relations. Uh, now, some judicial memoirs are overladen with achievements and war stories. Now, this is not such a book. Harry walks us through just some of his roles, by no means all, and there are a few well-chosen account of legal cases in which he participated. However, they always illustrate a larger theme and a number of subtexts, all of which are deeply appropriate for the present moment. I come away with a number of reactions to the book and in no particular order. First is a testament to courage and commitment this is part of the book's inspiration. Harry overcame significant obstacles to become a lawyer at all. Listen to this on page 12. Uh, 12. Now, there was an occasion when my parents decided to visit the school that he was in at the time to find out how I was doing. It was a difficult journey, but when they arrived, the headmaster saw them at their insistence. He shocked them by telling them he thought I was mentally retarded. <laughs> this they refused to accept, so I was removed forthwith from school and made the journey back to Glasgow with my parents. Trying to explain this diagnosis of my intellectual abilities, I have little doubt today that it was because I was dyslexic, although this had not been formally diagnosed. And then on page 15, he said that he wanted, if possible, from an early age to want to go to the bar, uh, and he'd become enthused about careers of famous lawyers. Uh, he was encouraged by one of his housemasters who thought that becoming a barrister was the one for profession for which I was not suited. He says. <laughs> uh, this was because in my teens I had a stutter, my goodness. Um, how did he overcome this? First, through the security of a very strong family identity and commitment uh, set out in, in the first chapter, which traces the impressive achievements of his extended family in different fields uh, after Harry's grandparents uh, immigrated to this country from Eastern Europe uh, in the late 19th century. And these achievements of his family range far and wide from football administration to the manufacture of the Rakuzen Matsas. Family then continues a light motif throughout the book where Marguerite's support in particular is so clearly and so rightly valued. So that was the family. Secondly, there was the sheer determination to prove the blighters wrong. 
and not to shirk something new that he was ever asked to do. And he was continually being asked and he continually gave of himself, such as the strong change of direction from his knockabout common law practice, which he started in, when he was offered the post out of the blue as revenue junior, which required him to plunge cold into advising the inland revenue, as it then was, on matters of tax. And it was from there that he went to immerse himself even deeper in public law uh, through the role of treasury devil, that is, legal advisor to the government. Harry says that he was drawn to a legal career through a sense of justice, sparked, for instance, from his and his brother's school experience, not only of anti-Semitism, but also having a punishment meted out to him before he was able to put his case. Uh, I, w I was about to say Audi Alterum Partim, and then I remembered he's banned, he banned Latin in the <laughs> access, access to Justice Report. <laughs> but here we must see the camouflage that Harry has always employed so successfully. But there's another element in all this which I discovered to my cost when I, as a very junior barrister, uh, first encountered Harry Wolf, then Treasury Devil, uh, about 1979. Uh, uh, we were challenging a decision of a planning inspector and my leader and I were convinced that we were on to a clear winner. There was no doubt about it whatsoever. Uh, Harry acted for the government uh, after my leader made his submissions with some self-satisfaction. Sat down really quite, quite pleased with himself, as was I, pleased with him. But Harry, acting for the government, then stood up and seemed for a moment a trifle hesitant, don't believe it for a second, ever, which was pleasing to us, and then suddenly, with a rapier thrust, honed in on the deficiency of the core of our argument and sat down within seconds. And we were completely deflated. And I realized then that Harry's benign manner and shining integrity um, were by no means incompatible with a sharp analytical propensity and an acute sense of relevance, qualities which mark the greatest lawyers and lie behind a number of his most almost throwaway comments in this book. So read it deeply because there's much more there than one originally sees. Another quality that Harry displays in the books is practicality and a talent for a form of the most effective kind. He never left any institution as he found it. I was amazed to see this throughout the book. Again, these throwaway lines. Um, Master of the Rolls, but at the same time he uh, oversaw the significant implications of procedure re judicial review. Treasury devil encountering a huge workload almost casually mentions his establishing panels of junior counsel to whom particular classes of cases would be delegated. And these panels to this day provide invaluable experience to barristers in a new, unique understanding of the government perspective. We just see them now as part of the furniture, Harry's invention. And yet there's a further quality that comes through this book, which is inclusivity. Harry mentions inheriting his father's propensity for conciliation and mediation. And we see this in his co-founding of the Wolf Institute, promoting interfaith cooperation. We see this in his willingness to engage with countries which do not necessarily share our values without in any way abandoning his own rock-like principles. Uh, the best example of this combination of principle and uh, uh, um, accommodation uh, is shown in his account of his years as Chief Justice. This was a remarkable time uh, uh, when the Blair government suddenly decided to transfer political responsibility from the Lord Chancellor to the Home Secretary without consultation with the Chief Justice or anyone else much, including the then Lord Chancellor Lord Urban. Uh, this scheme was then changed, again without consultation, to, to a proposal abolishing the road of, uh, role of Lord Chancellor and appointing instead Lord Falconer to a new office of Minister of Constitutional Affairs. Harry describes so lightly in very few pages uh, what was an intense period of stress, and to him, I'm sure, and to the legal profession, uh, of constitutional stress. And it required a, a vast amount of careful negotiation. Uh, in particular, he insisted that the great office of Lord Chancellor not be abolished without the authority of Parliament, uh, which would require at least 300 Acts of Parliament. Uh, <laughs> 
um, Harry felt that he had to postpone his retirement at age 70 to mediate the situation, uh, which included coordinating the judges' council, establishing a concordat between the judiciary and the government, and implementing an entire new, new constitutional settlement in the spirit of the reforms that were required, including the creation of a new Supreme Court and an independent Judicial Appointments Commission. Major reform was achieved, but with no compromise with that vital principle of judicial independence. Although Harry bemoans the fact that there was no alternative but to leave the decision as to whom to appoint as Lord Chancellor to the Prime Minister. He says on page 107, uh, nine individuals have been appointed, who have, through ignorance or other shortcomings, just not been up to the standards the job requires. <laughs> he is equally forthright about attempts to diminish our human rights, hoping the government will not repeal or damage the impact of the Human Rights Act, stating that there are still, from time to time, alarming rumbles of discontent, the latest being from Dominic Raab talking of limiting the role of judges. And he makes a similar plea for the retention of judicial review uh, as a vital protection of the rule of law. In, in conclusion, and let me then go back to the context of UCL Provost, I must mention uh, how important Harry has been uh, in helping to bridge the academic practitioner divide, which was when he began at the bar, and even when I began at the bar, a huge gulf. Um, he did this both through administration, he was Chancellor of the University of London, Chair of the UCL Council, visiting professor, professor and fellow, fellow uh, 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 here and of, of the Open University of Israel. And through his own writings and through his many appearances at academic meetings and conferences, he would again, when asked, you could be sure that Harry would do it. And in this book, he recalls uh, one such academic conference in Florence in the early 90s. Uh, it was the time when we were on a train together and he asked me to join him in editing the text by Stanley de Smith, the late Stanley de Smith, on judicial review. And I remember that conference so well, uh, particularly for the struggling interpreters who had great difficulty translating, the, particularly the Italians, who spoke at breakneck speed, unlike Harry, who spoke at his normally measured pace. But what I did gather from the translation I just picked up was a constant reference uh, to the words of wisdom that the Italians seemed to venerate of someone I've assumed was an obscure media, me, medieval Italian legal philosopher named Serrari until it suddenly dawned on me <laughs> that they were referring to our, an, our own Serrari Wulfa. <laughs> Very few individuals have or will have Harry's qualities of courage, principle, practicality, inclusivity, plus a deep understanding of the requirement, the necessary requirements of a democratic constitution, not only parliamentary sovereignty, but also human rights, judicial review, and so on. However, this book, modest in intent and tone, does provide us with lessons in how each of these qualities can be combined to best effect and how sorely needed they are now so as to guide our unwritten constitution to a future that is as benevolent and as humane as Harry's influence has proved to be. I'm now asking Francis Gibb to, um, to, to, to interrogate Harry. <laughs> Light interrogation, it is called. Um, you will probably all know her. She covered legal affairs for the Times for more than 35 years, uh, including 20 years as legal editor. She's now a freelance, freelance writer and journalist, writing pieces for the Times, Sunday Times, Spectator, and Council magazine. Earliest th this year, she had a book published 
A Time and Place, George Crabb, A-B-B-E, Alderborough and Suffolk, about the 18th century poet whose poem Peter Grimes inspired Benjamin Britten's opera of that name. There is the book she tells me, like Harry's, was a result of lockdown. <laughs> Francis. <laughs> Geoffrey, thank you very much. And it's, it's a great pleasure and a privilege, I must say, to be here this evening to be part of the launch of Lord Wolfe's autobiography. I've read quite a few legal autobiographies, and I must say, as, been, as has been commented on, they are often a catalogue of glittering prizes. But um, this one really isn't. It, it, it's wonderfully modest and self-effacing. And um, just as a way of example, um, Harry says in it at one point, um, you know, I have, throughout my career, he says, I have a habit of having good ideas which do not turn out so well in practice. Yeah. And he gives many such examples of these. I mean, that's probably his modest approach. I don't think we'd all agree. Anyway, um, I will, uh, I think because we have a competing event tonight, I can't begin without asking Harry, or kicking off, I think I should say, <laughs> sorry about the pun, uh, asking Harry about Qatar and uh, to ask him a little bit about whether he thinks uh, the FIFA should have set up the World Cup there and whether you had any concerns yourself when you went there to set up the commercial court about human rights. Well, th thank you very much, Francis. I certainly had uh, concerns when I, I thought I was going to be offered the job of setting up a uh, court in Qatar because I was doubtful that the Emir knew I was Jewish. So his response when I asked him whether he thought this was a, going to be embarrassing to him that he should have appointed a Jew to set up a court in one of the leading <laughs> Arab countries he said, oh no, the fact you're Jewish will make it clear that you'll be independent. <laughs> and I that was rather nicely uh, put. And, and what about the human rights record of the country? Was that of concern to you? Uh, oh, cer certainly. I mean, I was invited to come in and set up this court. When I'm very delighted that here tonight are some of the judges who helped me. But the one thing that I think was important and which I feared about was not once, as far as I'm aware, during the period I was working in Qatar, did the government try to interfere with the judiciary. I was conscious there was something I had to watch out for. It didn't happen, and I think that is some credit <coughs> uh, to the Qataris. They have, uh, uh, of course, the embarrassment of wealth and to such a scale that it's difficult for them to quite understand how the rest of the world lived. I, of course, was not involved in those who were doing the construction work, which has led to such criticisms in Qatar. But I do suspect that if it was to be looked into, by an independent individual, he would find that it isn't such a one-sided story as we've been hearing over the last few days. It was quite a remarkable thing for a Middle East country in the atmosphere which then existed to choose to have a British court established to administer justice in commercial matters there was a good reason for it, which I don't need to dwell on, namely that the reputation of that court would benefit Qatar. But it did show, I thought, a remarkable insight into the, the wider world that this country that had been blessed with this wealth was small in size was coming from very basic beginnings, should be establishing itself, that it did actually ask for this court to be created. Mm. And, and presumably, for drawing from those comments, I can take it, or we can take it, that you support the World Cup taking place there. 
<laughs> well, they, very w wisely, the one matter that uh, the provost, in his very kind remarks, glazed over was my athletic uh, contribution to the activities in university college. They weren't very impressive. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and I really feel that it's very difficult for somebody that such as myself to venture an opinion on that matter. All I can say is that if somebody questioned how a British judge should be prepared to assist in the way that we were, the Qataris, to show that they knew something about the right of the, of the, the rule of law, that they went to considerable expense and trouble to attract an independent body which prov provided justice in that part of the uh, Middle East for those who felt they wouldn't otherwise get justice. All right. Yes. Okay. Well, let's let's go back to your to your own career. And as uh, Jeffrey has said, it's been a really stellar career, reaching three of the highest judicial posts in the legal hierarchy. Um, and so I think it's very interesting, and Jeffrey's already referred to it. In fact, he's stolen most of my lines already, but <laughs> never mind. That, that um, you, you were told, as, as we heard, by a teacher that law was the one profession for which you were not suited. This was when you were at Fetters College. How did you feel about that? <laughs> I felt that it was something that I felt compelled to show them they were wrong about. <laughs> so actually, that was a, a bit of a, a, a trigger to your say, thinking to yourself, I will become the barrister, I will do it. And, and how, how pleased I am that I did have the opportunity of having a legal career at the bar in this country. Do you, you, we've mentioned, it has been mentioned, your dyslexia, and you, you struggled, struggled with a stutter as well. How much of a disadvantage were those uh, difficulties? Well, I think that's something I also touch on in, in, in the book, and that is the fact that one of the great things about the bar is that once you're a member of the bar, all the other members of the bar are your colleagues and treat you fairly and support you when they can. And that has been one of the great joys of my career. You, you, I mean, you do talk a little bit about the difficulties of getting into chambers, although I don't think you encountered it yourself, did you? Uh, and you went to, as we know, to one crown office row. But it was, there was anti-Semitism around for some people of your background. Yes, that is uh, uh, sadly correct. You didn't experience that yourself? I was personally very fortunate. You're lucky. Yes. So, so you went to the bar and you were fortunate as, in having a reasonably um, wealthy background, I think. You, you, you grew up in Newcastle and your parents ran a house building business which was quite successful. Um, so how did you find life at the bar then and how different is it from now? Well, it was a great, one of the great advantages, I think, then as opposed to now is it's so much, it was so much smaller. It was so personal. And you all knew all your colleagues. And you describe, you know, daily tea in chambers, yes, that yes. sort of thing. Yes. And the numbers, I think there were 12 members, you mentioned, of one Crown Office row. And I think it's probably about 100 now, isn't it? That's right. So is the change for the, bar, for the better or for the worse, would you say, the increase in the size of the bar? I, I think that uh, the needs in deciding whether it's for the better or for the worse, you've got to take the needs of society today into account. They are immeasurably larger than they were when I started practice. And so to that extent, I think it's been better because it's enabled the legal system to cope with the additional challenges by which they are faced. Mm. You then, you specialised in, before too long, you specialised in public law. And I'd like to take the opportunity to ask you, 
What is your feeling about the way that judicial review has grown, and particularly about government attempts in recent years to rein it back or put curbs on the rights of people to bring judicial review challenges? Or threaten to do so. Or threaten to do so, indeed. Yes. <laughs> Francis, um, yeah. because, because I've mentioned threaten to do so, because judicial review has gone from strength to strength since I first got involved in it as a young barrister. And before it was really embedded. And it's only had this extraordinary success and so that it plays a greater and greater part in our lives because of the needs of, the, of, of present time. The pressures of, on the government to just tinker here and tinker there mm. with our protections is very large. But does it concern you that they want to, uh, well, they keep trying, as you say, to rein it back? <clears throat> well, I think that that would be one of the greatest mistakes this country could make if it was, was to accede to some of the proposals that have been made by uh, some of our most senior ministers to do that. We'll, we'll come on to your, your view of uh, ministers and their attitude to the rule of law, but uh, just um, still really thinking about your earlier days and when you were first went on to the bench and became a sentencing judge. And um, you, you, you're very honest about some of your experiences and how you think you sometimes got it wrong. And there's a remarkable incident when um, you, Marguerite, who was a magistrate, was sitting in the back of your court and told you that night that she thought you'd been far too harsh, actually, in that case. And so would you like to describe what happened then? Yeah. <laughs> well, I realised it wasn't something that should happen every day. But I knew I had to call the prisoner back into court and tell him the sentence I had imposed was too heavy and reduce it as appropriate. Which is which was quite a brave thing to do. I'm sure that the press had a field day on that. <laughs> um, then you, you went on actually not, not to have a reputation as a, as a harsh judge, but as a, a, a lenient judge. In fact, you describe a, a wonderful episode when um, one of the tabloids, I think you, you think it's the sun, sent a van round to the High Court to remove your a removal van to take away your effects because they said you were absolutely not just wet but dripping wet <laughs> and uh, and it was it was all about your your opposition to the um, to increasing the lengths of sentences can you can you uh, give us your thoughts about that episode did it worry you it did worry me and it still worries me that unfortunately we've had the most immense inflation in what is considered as the appropriate sentence to today when with comparison to what the rates were when I first became a judge. What I think the government lose sight of is that if you are going to reform the policy with regard to growing numbers of people committing crimes, you won't do it just by hiking sentences. And that was a very silly failure of policy, which has continued till today. And I'm afraid I take, take the view that it is, we, ha we had as a nation a reputation of having a very, very fine justice system. And I think the blot on that system, which exists up till now, is that we increasing use of longer sentences. What is reali not realized is that if you increase sentences, that the public and the offenders who are punished get immune to the change and the inflation which is taking place. And one of the th sad things 
I feel that we've done is we've continued to impose longer and longer sentences at greater and greater expense, which should have not, in fact, achieved anything more if only those resources were used as they can be, not in respect of all offenders, but a large percentage of offenders, of tackling the causes of the offending, that would be so much more effective. And it must be of concern to you that there seems no sign of that, that trajectory changing. I mean, if anything, there, there, there are noises being made, not least by the Prime Minister, about the need for more punitive sentences. That's absolutely right. And of course, then there's the impact on prisons. And you, as has been mentioned, you produced your landmark report on overcrowding uh, after the Strangeways riots. What, looking back, do you think that's achieved anything? I, I certainly wouldn't say nothing has been achieved, but what I hoped would be achieved has not been achieved. And I think I've already made it clear that I don't believe that increasing sentences does necessarily achieve an objective which is important and critical if we are going to use the resources that we have to the best effect. What was the night in the prison cells like that you spent? Well, I'm thinking you had two actually, didn't you? You yeah. had one as an offender, or at least a, a, a defend, say a suspect, after <laughs> protesting about um, uh, the banning of rag night that uh, Geoffrey alluded to, and then you and Marguerite volunteered later in your career to spend a night. I think, I think the second uh, experience was by far the most telling because I had to justify Marguerite being locked up with me. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure I ever quite managed that. <laughs> so to, and let's take then your other major report, which was the one on civil justice. Um, again, I mean, that, that was an absolute upheaval and uh, designed to try and tackle the biggest failings of the system at that time, and maybe even now costs and delays um, and accessibility. Um, how do you, looking back, how do you feel, or let's say, what is your estimate of how that has worked? It's worked to an extent, but nothing like to the extent that I feel was necessary and is still necessary today. Would you like to expand a little bit? <laughs> Very uh, brief. <laughs> yeah. What still needs to be done, put it that way? Well, what I feel is so important is that we should take the system as a whole and not just fix sentences because of a particularly heinous crime individually but to take the system as a whole and produce so, uh, something which works as a whole. And it only works as a whole if it fits in with what, other, what else is happening within the system. Okay, thank you. Um, can we go on to constitutional reform and as uh, Jeffrey's alluded to, the Constitutional Reform Act? That was really a momentous time, and you were very instrumental in it. You say in the book that you feel regretful that you, you didn't, couldn't do more to safeguard um, the, the responsibilities and the way that the Lord Chancellor is appointed. Can you, can you tell us a little more about that? Well, it's not a, really as much as how they're appointed, but who is appointed, which I'm very concerned about. And what I'm concerned about is the same thing I've been saying again and again over these, the, while I'm detaining you far too long. But what uh, is so important is the, the inflationary effects of, uh, on, what, uh, on the punitive policies is not ignored 
and so that it's out of control. I'm thinking more um, of the recent appointments. You were quite um, scathing about our recent run of uh, Lord Chancellor's stroke justice secretaries, and I'm wondering whether um, you think they've had enough sufficient regard for the rule of law. What do you think of the attitude of our ministers to the rule of law? I, I, I fear that, unfortunately, the people who have been chosen have been put into this most important office of state without really recognising that they've never been prepared for what they're faced with and that their proposals will be flawed by the fact that in practice the world is different from the one we, which we enjoy. I, in particular, I think the rubbish that is written about the Human Rights Act and the beneficial effects of that on our society just don't stand examination. Do you mean the criticisms don't stand examination? <laughs> yes. And what is your view of the proposals to have a new British Bill of Rights? Well, I, I think that it is a classic example of the changes that I feel just would not be promoted if the, those who had the power had the experience, because experience would tell them that you can't benefit the system by uh, this country taking a view that we can't manage with a Bill of Rights which other countries in Europe and in the rest of the world find essential to the running of contemporary society. So you would not, by the sound of it, support latest proposals to replace the Human Rights Act and start with a new British Bill of Rights? No, I would not. Thank you. I mean, just finally, I think um, uh, Geoffrey would like me to wind up. Uh, looking at the state of our justice system, and I mean the criminal and the civil justice system, looking back over your time, um, still, you know, we've, we've had barristers on strike, we've got massive backlogs of cases, we, we have a squeeze on funding and uh, no further funds coming in the autumn statement last week. What is your view of the state of the justice system today compared with when you started out? Well, I think one of the great things about our justice system is despite the difficulties that are created for it, it still is the finest justice system of any country which has a developed society. And as long as that continues, I think the, despite the, the obstacles, the countries will continue to benefit from what is, I think, absolutely at the heart of what any country needs. And that is they have a system that can do justice between one citizen and another. Thank you very much. <clears throat>Thank, thank you, Val. Thank you so much. Um, we have a roving microphone for anybody who would like to ask questions here. There are also people online, but I cannot see any questions. I'm afraid I've seen a few statements that I cannot get to the link to work. Is there a problem? Nothing plays. But perhaps that's history. Maybe they're in now. Are we aware of that at all? Yes, uh, yes, people are watching online. Don't move again. You're watching online. It's very yeah. Oh, good. Well, uh, yeah. It's not coming up here, so I can't see any questions. I'm no, delighted to know that. But anyway, let's start here in this room. Any questions? Yes. Ma would you say who you are? Thank you. Uh, I'm Mark Solon. Um, perhaps Lord Wolf could uh, address the future of law. Uh, Francis has indicated some of the problems we have now, but where do you see the legal system, English legal system going in, say, 10 years, or w what's the direction, do you think? Well, I, I hope that there will there'll be a flash of light and governments will realise just what a treasure we have in our justice system and leave it alone to continue as it should do. 
I hope that will happen. I'm not confident it will happen. Thank you. Yes. By the way, sorry, can I just interrupt one? There are five seats, I see five or six people, there are five seats in the front row if you want to rest yourselves. If you're happy there, that's fine. Uh, Lord Will, thank you very much indeed, if I may call you Harry, because you're my first cousin. Um, it's been a pr privilege to follow your career in the, uh, in the law, uh, sort of in a long way behind you, but admiring you as I go along. But I just wanted to ask one question. You've made very clear your antipathy to the extension of, uh, of prison sentences. Um, I've always taken the view that the fact that the training prisons, the facilities for rehabilitation have diminished consecutively, significantly as the years have gone by. I mean, I used to be quite involved in Latchmere House, which has been closed. Um, I wonder if, you would make, if you'd like to comment about how you compare the, the, the contrast between the absence of training facilities in prisons and the extension of, of, of prison sentences. I think there's a direct link because the best way of demonstrating what I've been advocating of, of a constructive approach to criminal justice in particular is being reduced. Anyone else? Yes. <coughs> uh, James Rothman. Uh, we hear these days a lot about productivity. I just wonder, uh, from your experience, and if you measure productivity by the amount of time or the amount of man hours required to reach a decision in a case, whether civil or criminal, has that uh, increased or decreased over the years? I think it's increased because of our ability to retain material, and in particular, to have so much more uh, re reduced to a, a more, or at least a semi-permanent form. So it takes less time now to reach the decision than it did? No, I, on the contrary, are. I'm saying the opposite. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. I apologize for not making myself clear. Right there. Thank you. I'm Stuart Sanders, I'm also a cousin of you, Harry. <laughs> I, I've packed the audience. <laughs> well, well supported by family. Harry, in your scintillating career, what do you think has been the most significant contribution to humankind that you have made? <laughs> yeah. Stuart, I'm afraid I, I, I would have great difficulty in, def, def, in def, defining any part of my contribution which falls within the description that you've given it. That's a, that's a trying to have a, a, a let out from answering a question which I would find very difficult to answer. Um, Edward Folks, and I'm not one of your cousins. Uh, um, you're also, which you haven't mentioned, a legislator as well as being a very distinguished judge. I wonder what you think of the role of the House of Lords in view of the recent announcement that it may well be abolished. I find it readily understandable that today the House of Lords should be subject to proposals of that sort. All I can say is that from my exposure to the House of Lords, it would be a very retrograde step. I know of no legislator, legislator, legislative body in any other country that can compare with the what can be the contribution of the Lords. Not all the members of the House of Lords contribute to an equal extent. My contribution is tiny, but what is the extraordinary thing is you've got a body where the majority of the members 
are not motivated by self-interest, where they have got a special expertise and they make that special expertise available to the country as a whole. So there's no part of, all of the House of Lords that wouldn't be open to improvement, but to abolish it would be, in my view, an act of sacrilege. Anyone else? Is that it? Um, you sure? I can't see anybody online. Is there anyone who can help me with that? Jimmy, you've had your question. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm, can, can you find, if I, I'm, for those online, I do apologize. It's just not coming through here, but I hope you've enjoyed uh, the evening and that it was visible and audible to you in a way that I'm afraid you are not to me at this very minute. Um, uh, I'm pleased you asked a question, Edward, because um, Harry does mention your report on judicial review in his book and is very favorable to your critical but tolerant view of judicial review, which you wanted very much to continue largely in the mode that it, that it, that it, that it has, has been in, uh, since it has been expanded since the 60s, uh, which judges such as Lord Diplock have called, called the greatest contribution in the common law in their judicial lifetimes, and in which, of course, Harry was a, a major contributor. Uh, that, of course, is now, uh, has, has now passed into legislation somewhat modified. But um, there we are. That seems at least safe. Um, I'm, I ought to, I'm, I'm, I'm not a cousin, but I would <laughs> like to tell you that um, it, I'm sure this won't interest anyone, but I'd like to just mention it, get it off my chest. My wife, um, we found this well after um, we, Harry and I started knowing each other and working together. My wife. Uh, Francis's father was someone called Moses Sussman, who, whose wife is mentioned in the book. And um, he studied in the 20s in Newcastle. And well after we knew each other, we found, Francis found a letter from, from him to his mother saying, uh, I'm lodging with Mrs. Wolf." turned out to be Harry's grandmother. Uh, she's a very nice lady, etc., etc. Don't worry, she's, even though we're in England and not in South Africa where he was from, now she's giving me quite enough fruit and vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> so bravo, Harry, to her, yeah. to your grandfather, uh, from, who, uh, from whom you were named Harry, uh, to your extraordinary work, to your performance tonight. Francis, thank you. Everyone, thank you. And I think we move from here. Is there something after this, or is that it? There's, there's uh, And one thing I wanted to say, thank you uh, to you, Maggie, um, uh, who's also played a, a role in this. And people, as we walked in, Harry's assistant um, said to me, somebody said to her, uh, did you do much on this book? And she was quite aghast, and she's absolutely right. Harry wrote every single word of it. No, no other writers were involved. And his voice comes through as clearly as it did tonight. Um, so I wanted to say that this book um, is, uh, the royalties from the book are going to the Wolf Institute. By the book. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gabriel.